Hollywood is the hometown that all Americans share. It's a magic factory town where fantasies are stamped to order. Hollywood is more than just a place in Southern California. From the very beginning, the name itself has been kind of a shorthand for an industry, an idea, and a way of life. And although Hollywood is constantly rebuilding itself, landmarks from its earliest days can still be found and explored. I'm Bill Boggs on a tour through old Hollywood where the studio backlots and the movie palaces are the workshops of America's dream factory and are all places worth exploring for every historic traveler. Here's looking at you, old Hollywood. Our trip will focus on the heyday of the Hollywood studio system, from the talkies to television. Our first stop will be a behind-the-scenes tour of Warner Brothers Studios, where pictures first found their voice. Then we'll have a chance to admire Hollywood's fabulous movie palaces and other landmarks. And finally, we'll go west by heading east to the old Tucson backlot, where some of the great cowboy pictures were filmed. From the film colony's earliest days, there have really always been two Hollywoods. There's the company town, where actors, directors, and craftspeople live and work. And then there's the glamorous, legendary Hollywood that lives in the imaginations of film lovers the world over. These two Hollywoods come together on the Warner Brothers Studio Tour. Many of the studios offer public tours, but this is the one to take if you want an authentic view of Hollywood history. Unlike the others, the Warner Tour is not a theme park ride. It's a glimpse behind the scenes of a real working studio. Nothing is staged, and whatever's going on that day is what you see. Visitors should call ahead to reserve a space on the tour, which runs Monday through Friday and is closed on the weekends. Tour director Dick Mason started here almost 40 years ago as a personal assistant to Jack Warner himself. Well, tell me a little bit about the history of Warner Brothers. Well, it's the only really family-owned major studio in American film history. There were four brothers involved, Sam, Harry, Albert, and Jack. They all did something a little bit different for the company. And the last brother, Jack Warner, retired in 1967 and passed away in 1978. So until 1978, it was Warner Brothers owned and operated by the Warner Brothers. The first stop on the tour is the Studio Museum, which has artifacts stretching all the way back to the silent era and the dawn of the talkies. In 1927, the Jazz Singer opened, featuring vaudeville star Al Jolson. It was the first feature film with sound, and Dick Mason says the movie saved Warner Brothers. Well, at the time, middle, late 20s, the business wasn't so good in our industry, and Warner Brothers is no exception. They were nearly bankrupt. And Vitaphone was a sound process they were working on, and it was doing, becoming successful, and so they decided to make the jazz singer with Al Jolson. Paying Mr. Jolson was a big problem in itself because there was no money much, so they had to move money around by bank to bank and finally get his paychecks to him. But then when the jazz singer came out, it was highly successful, phenomenal success. And for about four to five years after the release of that film, Warner Brothers had the patent on sound through this Vitaphone process. So they got a real head start on everybody else and became very wealthy at the time. It was Warner Brothers' golden age as the studio opened movies and built up the shining stars of the era, all well represented in the museum's collection of memorabilia. This is one of my favorite artifacts in the Warner Museum. If you're a movie lover, you'll have no trouble recognizing a Maltese Falcon. This blackbird got title billing in the 1941 noir classic that made Humphrey Bogart into a star. What have you ever given me beside money? you ever given me any of your confidence, any of the truth? Haven't you tried to buy my loyalty with money and nothing else? What else is there I can buy you with? These are just a few of the more than 100 Oscars won by Warner Brothers over the years. This one is for Best Picture of 1943, Casablanca. Other items from Casablanca are on display here as well, including some props and the trench coat that became Bogey's trademark. I was willing to shoot Captain Rano, and I'm willing to shoot you. All right, Major, you asked for it. Casablanca provides a pretty good example of how things change as filming proceeds. Originally, it was going to be called 
Everybody Comes to Rick's, possibly starring George Raft. Max Steiner, who wrote the score, didn't want to use the song as time goes by because he thought it was too simple. But luckily, cooler heads prevailed on what many people think is the best film ever made. The museum also pays homage to Warner Brothers' lengthy heritage in the world of animation, with a display of animation sketches and cells featuring Bugs, Daffy, and the whole termite terrorist gang. From the museum, visitors are taken around the back lot on studio golf carts. The New York street set should be familiar to any fan of the old gangster pictures starring Jimmy Cagney or Edward G. Robinson. The studio built this exterior in the 30s so it could avoid the expense and unpredictability of shooting on a real city street. Warner Brothers used this Midwestern street set anytime they needed small town USA. You've probably seen it in East of Eden, The Music Man, or dozens of other TV shows and films. It's even got a village green, a gazebo, and a town square. The residential section of Midwestern Street was built back in 1941 for a movie starring an actor with big ambitions. The movie was King's Row, and the actor was Ronald Reagan. We were going to run away. She'd been getting out to meet me for a long time. Do I need to say anything more? Did Dr. Tower know anything about this? I guess I wouldn't be here today if he had. The backlot tour includes a fascinating look behind the scenes at Warner's famous art department, where scenery is under construction for upcoming film and television productions. And the studio's mammoth wardrobe warehouse, bursting with costumes dating back decades and including everything from ordinary street clothes to chain mail armor. The scenery and the costume department's part of the reason why Warner Brothers was so successful in the old days. Jack Warner's idea was to make and warehouse all the wardrobe and sets right here on the lot and never rent anything or build anything twice if it could be avoided. It saved a lot of money in the long run. Once these movies were finished, moguls like Jack Warner and Louis B. Mayer wanted to show them off in a suitably glamorous setting. They'd arrange a premiere at one of the majestic movie palaces that in those days were all owned by the studios themselves. Our tour of old Hollywood now moves from the Burbank home of Warner Brothers to downtown Los Angeles, where the moguls built some of the earliest monuments to the movie business. Opulent Renaissance architecture, hand-painted frescoes, crystal chandeliers, and gilded columns. The Biltmore recalls Hollywood's bygone era of glorious excess. Those were the days when, as Groucho Marx put it, the parties were lush, and so were most of the guests. Today, the Regal Biltmore is the first stop on a walking tour of LA's historic Broadway Theater District. The tour is led by Gordon Johnson of the Los Angeles Conservancy. Isn't this great? It is beautiful. This is the original lobby of the Biltmore Hotel. This hotel was built by Cecil B. DeMille and a bunch of his cronies as a place to kind of come and hang out. This and the Ambassador Hotel were the two places where everybody came to see and to be seen. Mary Pickford and her high-toned Mayfair Society held white-tie dinner dances here. And it was right here in the Crystal Ballroom that the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences was formed in 1927. One of the founders made a sketch that night on a napkin. It was a design for a statuette that would later get the nickname Oscar. Over the coming years, several Academy Award programs would be held here in the Biltmore Bowl nightclub, including the 1937 show. That's part owner Cecil B. DeMille over there in the corner. From the Biltmore, Johnson guides the tour along L.A.'s own Broadway. In the 20s and 30s, this became downtown Los Angeles. It became the Great White Way of Los Angeles, and it became the shopping district of Los Angeles. So there are huge department stores down here and 12 magnificent movie palaces that you can still come down, take a look, and we'll wander in several of them. You'll get to see these wonderful Rococo interiors. The State Theater was built in 1921 by the man who later formed MGM, Marcus Lowe. Its plain facade hides a fanciful and exotic interior, complete with Moorish windows. 
There's even an enormous Buddha seated over the stage. The State was Broadway's most profitable theater for many years, booking both movies and burlesque acts. One of those early vaudevillians was Judy Garland in 1929, when she was just Little Frances Gum of the Singing Gum Sisters. Next stop, down the street to the Orpheum Theater, opened in 1926 by the Orpheum Vaudeville Circuit. The extravagant French Renaissance interior here is completely over the top with polished brass doors, brocade drapery, and enormous chandeliers. But the pride and joy of the Orpheum is this 13-rank Wurlitzer silent movie organ. It's one of the last of its kind, now lovingly restored by the Los Angeles Theater Organ Society. It can simulate 14,000 orchestral sounds, including tinkling bells. It's said that Jack Benny used to sneak out between his performances at the Orpheum to court his future wife, Mary Livingston, who was working across the street at the May Company department store selling lingerie. As lavish as the downtown picture palaces are, the best known movie house in Los Angeles, and perhaps on Earth, can be found on Hollywood Boulevard. Sid Grauman's Chinese Theater set the world standard for majestic movie premieres. When Grauman opened the theater in 1927, more than 100,000 people thronged the street in front of the theater. And today, hordes of tourists still crowd into the forecourt of the Chinese to marvel at the famous cement footprints and maybe try a few for size. The story goes that silent screen star Norma Talmadge visited the theater during construction and accidentally stepped in wet cement. Sid Grauman, always a showman, decided to turn the mishap into an event. And had Talmadge, Mary Pickford, and Douglas Fairbanks put their prints in cement at the grand opening. More than 180 celebrities have followed suit over the years, including Bogart, Betty Grable, who left a leg print, and John Wayne, who left his fist print. Many other stars are immortalized on the pavement in front of the theater in Hollywood's Walk of Fame. Photographer Delmar Watson has covered many Walk of Fame ceremonies. Well, it's really unusual. You got about, about 2,000 stars all along Hollywood Boulevard, clear down to probably Gower Street and all the way back up to La Brea. And you get a, you get a real collage of different types of actors here. Some of them you, you'll remember, and some of them they've lo either long been forgotten and or nobody cares. But it, it's, a, it's, it's probably the ultimate for a lot of people to have their stars on the walk. Watson himself comes from a large family of hard-working but little-known actors. The first major role people would remember would be Heidi. That's why I played Peter the Goat Boy with Shirley Temple in 1937. That and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. My three brothers and I, we played the governor's children in that. But Bob's was a real talent. He played Pee Wee in Boys Town. That's what you'd remember him best by, in both Boys Town and Minna Boys Town. And then he was a little kid that got dragged to death in Dodge City with Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland. So what was your dad's secret? What did he teach you that made you a good actor? We could both cry on cue without being tortured or anything. We just, my dad taught us the emotion. But Bob's was the real talent. It took me about 10 seconds to cry with real tears, and Bob's could do it in about eight seconds. One of the wonderful things about Hollywood is that it's constantly reinventing itself. But an unfortunate side effect for the historic traveler is that many Hollywood landmarks, like the Brown Derby restaurant that used to stand on this very spot, have been torn down. Still, visitors willing to look off the beaten path will be well rewarded. Tucked away near the Hollywood Bowl, you can find what looks like a ramshackle barn. It turns out this is the studio where Jesse Lasky directed the first feature film ever to be shot in Hollywood in 1913, a western called The Squaw Man. The barn has been moved from its original location and although closed after a fire, will soon reopen as a museum dedicated to the early days of the picture colony. As the Lasky studio shows, Hollywood's obsession with the Old West goes all the way back to the earliest days. But as we'll see in a moment, you don't have to stay in LA to see Hollywood.
Our journey through Hollywood history now takes an eastward turn that paradoxically sends us westward ho to the scene of hundreds of frontier movies and television shows, old Tucson studios outside Tucson, Arizona. By the late 1930s, the popularity of Western pictures was booming, but the studios wanted more realistic vistas and terrain for their Westerns than they could create on a Hollywood back lot. Naturally, that meant going on location. This building is an exact replica of Tucson, Arizona's first schoolhouse. Columbia Pictures built it as part of a carefully researched recreation of Tucson as it appeared in the 1860s for the film Arizona. Today, the old Tucson studios are open to the public as a combination amusement park and working film lot. Visitors can enjoy stunt shows, song and dance reviews, restaurants, even a train ride, right alongside movie companies shooting films, TV shows, and commercials. Visitors are free to walk right up and touch the sets they've seen hundreds of times at the movies. Unless, of course, they're currently in use by a film crew. After a hiatus during the Second World War, the old Tucson studios became a very popular location with Hollywood producers, who began shooting two or three pictures a year here. And many of those sets are still standing. Universal made Winchester 73 here, starring Jimmy Stewart and Shelley Winters. This is the corral that Paramount built for, you guessed it, gunfight at the OK Corral. And in 1958, Warner Brothers built this trading post for Rio Bravo. That was the first of many movies that the Duke, John Wayne, shot here. Jamie Eggold has researched that part of the studio's history. Well, actually, during the filming of Rio Bravo in 1958, Bob Shelton came on the property, and he decided to open the studio up to the public to watch the filming of the movie. John Wayne loved that idea, so he ended up becoming a silent partner in Old Tucson Studios. He shot three films after that first film. One of the best stories we have about John Wayne was in 1969 when he was out here filming Rio Lobo. He got called away to accept his Oscar for True Grit. Well, the day he returned here, no one would greet him, no one would say hello to him. He couldn't find his horse. Finally, he got to the back of the set where everybody was waiting for him, and they surprised him. Everyone had an eye patch on, even his horse, just like the eye patch he wore in True Grit. Over the years, more than 300 films and TV shows have been shot here, featuring every Western star you can think of. Burt Lancaster, Kirk Douglas, and many others. And that's just the movies. Television favorites like Wagon Train, Bonanza, and High Chaparral were also shot here. The High Chaparral set is one of the park's main attractions. The studio's prized possession is an authentic 1872 steam locomotive nicknamed the Reno. The train engine has been used in movies going back to the 30s, including Annie Get Your Gun and How the West Was Won. In 1995, a devastating fire destroyed over 40% of the studio and severely damaged the Reno. The cause of the blaze was never identified, but the damage forced the studio to shut down. The studio decided to rebuild and 20 months later reopened with improved visitor and filmmaking facilities. Old Tucson Studios is now attempting to restore the Reno. Although fire completely destroyed two of the authentic wooden cars, train experts are optimistic about the structural condition of the steam engine and believe that it can be refurbished. And in Hollywood, where the old often falls to make way for the new, that's a very happy ending for an antique like this. Your tour of the LA landmarks that we've outlined can be done in about two days. You should add another two days for the trip to Arizona to see old Tucson studios. Other places to visit in Southern California include a day trip to Santa Catalina Island off the coast, which was used as a location for such films as Mutiny on the Bounty and Treasure Island. You could also drive up the coast to San Simeon, where William Randolph Hearst built a castle that was the basis for Xanadu in Orson Welles' famous Citizen Kane. And from old Tucson studios, you might want to detour to Tombstone, Arizona, which of course was the locale of dozens of screen retellings of the gunfight at the OK Corral. 
The Hollywood sign was built back in 1923. Originally, it said Hollywood Land, promoting a new housing subdivision with the same name. By the late 40s, after many years of neglect, the last four letters of the sign slid down the hill, never to be replaced. But Hollywood really hasn't changed that much. What they make here is still the stuff that dreams are made of. I'm Bill Boggs. Thanks for joining me on Historic Traveler.